Ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to invite two deans to give us reflections on what has been said this morning. And uh, first, I would like to give the word to Professor Heine de Wilde, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Please use this microphone. Apart from being a dean, I'm a philosopher. <laughs> I have five minutes. I learned two things this morning. First, the importance of continuity. And that teaching is about basically doing the same thing for centuries now. You know, that is indeed, you know, trying to get some things across. Knowledge, skills, whatever. From here, somewhere over here to there, and also maybe the other way around. And at first, before we start talking about change, and change is important, first we have to understand continuities in education, and, and also the conservatism in education, and why also that is a good thing in certain respects. Good about that is, I think, that basically to all teaching is, it all starts, I would say, with dedication, dedication to your discipline, uh, dedication to your field, to your expertise, a love really for your field, and that you are really so full of that, you know, that you want to spread the news. And, and, and then, of course, yes, of course, we should look for more efficient ways, because I just spread the news, you will not listen, etc., etc., and then change comes in and all uh, educational science, etc., etc. But it starts with all that, I would say. It starts with dedication. Uh, and uh, also over here, also we are a very innovative university, and we still are, I would say, but there's also a lot of continuity, and we should start with cherishing that continuity and also appreciate that. Dedicated teachers and, 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 and motivated students and also the, the will of, of us, you know, to capture you. Uh, because we're full of our, our disciplines, our, the things what, which we think is, is are important. That's the first thing I learned. Start with that. Not with change or, or it's five past 12 or whatever. No. You know, we are doing the, the thing we have always done. We are part of a long tradition. Share is the tradition. That is an important function, indeed, of, of education. In, edu in education, the past is as important as the future. Not more important, as important. And that brings me to my second lesson. I think there, PBL is the key. But PB PBL, if, if we understand it well, it can bring, indeed, the balance between the past and the future. Between all these traditional things, dedication, love of your field, etc. And, indeed, listening to new knowledge, new circumstances, external factors, technology, all these kind of things. Uh, but how to do that? Well, I would say what for me is basic of PBL, it is that we are all not consumers, but producers of knowledge, that PBL imitates, simulates research, that we have an active approach. And a key to that is the feedback element in it. If PBL works well, we're not just learning things, or subjects or skills, we also learn to learn. So the, the best way to do PBL is to keep it open and to be open to evolution of PBL. And that I think we should learn again, because there is a lot of evolution of PBL in this institution in these 35 years. Uh, we see all kinds of PBL in our faculties. In my faculty, for instance, it is not gone, but you have different forms. And what we now do, and that is, I think, a new development, and that is being stimulated by the rector, by the leading and learning project, uh, is saying, hey, let's first understand this evolution. Where are we now, and why did we get this, this far, and why did we go that direction, not, not that direction? Start with that kind of research, learn from that, and then build upon that. And then I think ECT can play a role, but as important, I would say, is the dedicated teacher. It's still very important. Thank you.
if you're then, then the word is to her muscles. I think you're a psychologist. Yes. Not married. <laughs> Not married. Um, um, I think on this beautiful day, um, I wonder why they asked me to reflect. And I think one of, one of the considerations may be, I'm not sure, I didn't ask, is that I am optimist. Um, I thought we heard three very, very nice presentations, thought-provoking. But I also want to stress that within the picture that was painted about five past twelve and how difficult it sometimes is to uh, make changes, I think Maastricht University has always been quite rebellious. And so I think we are, as a university, so, sometimes quite ahead. Um, we have the international classroom and what we do all, and that is very instructive for everyone who is involved. You learn from different cultures, from different perspectives, and that's what we bring in and that's what we invest in a lot. Yet, and I think that is something that came to mind listening to the presentations, um, something that I sometimes think is that we don't listen well enough to students. Um, that is one thing that I think that Masters University, being rebellious and, 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 and forefront, I think there are many issues that we still need to address in our system, which I think we learned a lot today, but making platforms to listen to students and try to understand how, for example, the, the, the real world and the virtual world in student life interacts is something that we may actually learn more about. Or what I've noted is that nowadays it seems that personal lives and professional lives of students and also of alumni are much more interwoven than they were 30 years ago. Uh, students travel a lot. They, all of a sudden there is this requests for internships, for example. Students want internships, they want to travel, they want to... And maybe if you listen to the UCM students talking about think tank, I think that's part of the answers why they want this. Why do they want to learn in outside organizations? Um, my second point um, would be, again, from the optimistic side um, and reflecting a bit on, on, on the talk Wim Gijslas gave. Um, yes, there are students in lectures who are texting and who are Facebooking on laptops, but really, we used to play cards in lectures. So, um, uh, so you may actually... <laughs> Uh, may, may, so th I think maybe not as much has changed as we think there as well. Um, again, the other thing, the technology part, is, as Rein also said, it is important, but I think if you look at, for example, the think tank experience at the University, at University College Maastricht, where one of the, it was also mentioned, one of the aspects that students like is that they have their own classroom. And there, the, the, these, these rooms were quite close to my office, and I saw them bringing in plants. They asked whether they could um, wallpaper, use wallpaper on the walls, and make it like this real room, and not only the virtual room we have with Facebook. Et so I think, yes, um, there is this whole virtu virtual world, and students are in real and virtual worlds, but I really believe that we, uh, as Rein said, the dedicated teacher, also just create spaces that are real within the university um, with also dedicated teachers who, for example, and this is what I think happens, still happens and should continue and maybe get uh, improve, is that, that teachers sit down with, with students and say, let's talk about something. And what is on your mind? And, and, and these are the things I really would like to focus on, the, the optimistic view of Maastricht University. We, we, I think we're, we, we are rebels and we should stay rebellious. We, I like that. Um, rebellious students as well. Um, and, so, uh, uh, and, and really involve, well, rethink what we know of students and how we communicate with students and listen to them a little bit more. Those were the things that I would like to say. Thank you very much.
let's have some more discussion and involve you all. May I invite you to, um, to use the microphones and to, I would like to ask anybody to speak into the microphone because it has been recorded, but also it, then it will be understandable for everybody. I would like to invite the speakers to, to sit here and also the, of course the opponents and the students. Where are the students here? If you are trying to find a place here. Okay, so we have a number of issues. Educational change, technology, change of concepts for the next generation, ideas of students, listening to students, continuity or not, and rebellious university. Who can I give the word to give a comment, ask a question? Yes. You in the back. Um, hello. I'm Noi and I'm from the Econ School of Business and Economics and I'm from the Economic Department. I'm speaking on behalf of the tutor. I've been the tutor for the past three years. What I missed, I mean, I enjoyed uh, the, the morning session a whole lot. What I'm missing is the, the in between the link between the student and the educator. And it would have been nice if we have 10 minutes for the tutor to speak what they see also from their perspective. That's just my request for maybe the next time, if there ever one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So it's about interaction and the role of the tutor. Ah. Well, I think I, I, I know uh, Noy very well because she teaches at UCM and I think um, I think this is a misunderstanding because if we talk about teachers and if we talk about educators, uh, we, I, and I, I, know, I know your dedication as a tutor, so I think that includes you as well. <laughs> yes. Do you Maybe agree whether the tutor should, is, well, it's a sort of, of a logic consequence of being a tutor, that you have interaction? You feel the same way or not? Yes, Machtelt. But we have no microphone for you. No, I cry. She can shout. Shout I, loud. All of these things I was hearing this morning. I was teaching and being tutoring the mental faculty. But I don't really see how this all this can be applied really in the medical education. So you question the applicability in medical education? I don't know, maybe I can ask the dean. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm the dean of the Faculty of Health, Medicine and Life Science, Martin Paul. I'm married and not a philosopher. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> no, I think it applies to the medical faculty as well. I mean, if I observe our students, uh, they do the same thing. And the, the big issue I have is uh, how, do, how do we control the quality? of knowledge that is either taken out from us and or from the internet. Yeah. And the main difference in, 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 in a medical school is that if you do not control the quality and don't address these issues, you can kill patients. And uh, that I think is the big issue for me. If we address this on both sides of the corner and if we help our students to get this approach to self self-quality control, then I think we're on the right way. And I personally think uh, the issues that we have heard today, today the big uh, challenges on one hand of the world of technology, of the real world, of real people, that is also very relevant for us. I think so too. I agree. Are more people from the medical faculty that have comments? I know that there are a couple of people from the medical faculty. Yes, you, and then I come to you. In, in the back, uh, not yet. In, completely in the back. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Jan de Eur and I'm a medical student. 
Um, what I can relate to actually from what I see, what I've seen this morning is that the, 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 the PPL system is actually very, very useful in the, um, in the learning of, uh, of the contents actually of the medical education. And if you talk about the practice, the practical learning, that's a whole different story and that's a whole different side of the medical education. And actually that's something that we haven't talked about this morning a lot, of course, but well, that's obvious. Um, so I actually think that the PBL system, the innovation that it's, is needed is also uh, very applicable in the medical education and it's more talking about the, well, what I said, like learning the, the way, uh, the biology, learning the, the basics actually of, of what you as a medical student need to be able to fulfill your job as a, as a physician later on. So I think that the, the practical way of learning it is very um, innovative as well and I think there's so There's enough space to use it. You think it's applicable? What has what you have heard this morning, for example, from the uh, university college students? Well, yeah, that's that's maybe a different story because the think tank is uh, well, it can be used, of course, but I think it would be less relevant for medical students. But uh, in general, the PBL system and the way it's worked now, I think it's very applicable. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Now there was a question first here, and then I'll come to you. The gentleman with the spectacles. Yes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ruhi Kramer. It's from this university's Faculty of Law. Not married and not a philosopher, so I really got the short end of this tour. First, there was a little quote that I got from a friend of mine who, who was at Oxford, and he said, "I strongly believe that you should never get that you should never let teaching get in the way of a good education." Um, and with that. I wanted to come to a couple of things that uh, Professor Kaiser has pointed out. And the first one was a very interesting thought that indeed, in a way, our competitors are no longer Google, uh, are no longer Harvard or Oxford, but it is Google. But there in itself is a problem. Information that you get from Google is not value free. And there will always be, unless we possess at some point super superhuman processing capabilities, we will need aggregators and we will need stamps of approval. And traditionally, these used to be newspapers. We trusted the NSE or, or Le Monde or the Times better than we would trust the local village newspaper. And the same thing is true for universities. Connection to a university and then even a certain university would give a sort of quality branding to knowledge. And this is true both for teaching but also for the other very important thing that we do, and that's research. And there, I also, uh, I would like to briefly touch upon a second point, which is that, and, and here I very much agree with, with uh, Professor De Wilde, when we think about who we are, we should also have a strong belief of our identity and our added value in, in whole society. And I believe one of the strong points of university is that at least we should be, I feel, independent in the way that we can have the luxury of just pausing for a moment and being maybe a sort of social conscience but reflecting on change rather than going into change because it's change for the sake of change itself. I'd like to hear your comments on that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering how I could disagree with you and uh, I think, I think the issue is uh, uh, Google is a real threat because uh, there is a disconnect between what we believe, what we do, and what we actually do. Because we as academics uh, like to say like, yeah, but you know, Google, it doesn't give us the right information. We should, students learn how to learn and how to assess the validity of all the information which is just waiting there. That's the point where I agree with you. Where I disagree is whether we are at this moment, we are doing a right job on it. We used to do a right job at, uh, before Google, because then we were training uh, when this university was a smaller institute, and we were very much uh, dedicated to making students alert about why different authors could have different views. And when we became a larger industry, we were a little bit drifting away from, from it because our, our focus was becoming more and more on content. And that's just a natural mechanism. And I, I told people that when you're passionate about something, 
Then the, the, the biggest problem for passionate people is that to allow others that they should develop and become a passionate person. But that's not by saying to the other, you should be passionate or, you know, just like when I started teaching, I just started talking louder in the beginning to make myself clear, which didn't help the learner at all. So my point is that, that instead of being scared for the technology, you should incorporate it. And in my point is also as well, it's already happening. So use the tool and put it in the tradition. And there it connects to Rang. And put it in an evolutionary ap approach or where you integrate the, the potential of technology in your further development of PBL. And the second message of me is stick to your roots because we are a university and it's very hard to copy from our university. We have built up a culture where we feel it's perfectly normal to question anything which shows up in real life and connected with academic knowledge. I think that's where our strength lies. And when you get hard, uh, huge institutions like massive higher education students I was talking about, the risk is always that you will lose it because it needs a lot of training for your teachers before they get acquainted with this kind of method. So yes, I agree with you, but I disagree on you know, the way we behave and what we believe what we're doing. Because I think we need to make an additional effort in it to keep it the way, you know, and what we have been standing for so far. This looks like a philosophical answer because I can see from your eyes like, you know, what is he talking about? Well, um, first, rain and then you. Well, I would say technology is, is never just a tool, it's always a challenge. If you take e-learning, for instance, we see of course, you know, that there is an urge to use it and, and there are all, a lot of things happening out there and changes which also encourage us to, to use it. But then the challenge is really how to use it in, in a fruitful way and also in a way which stimulates, you know, the, the learning process or, or even innovates the learning process in a good way. And there really the, the, the design comes in. And there is no straightforward answer, you know, how to bring in e-learning. That is also why it so often uh, does not really succeed. And, and, uh, uh, and there is also, I think, that is also part of leading in learning. If we could bet, be better in that, you know, not just we should have more e-learning. No, you know, what's really the problem over there? And in what sense can we really... Uh, make tools into, yeah, how you say that, uh, uh, a tool which really works and really enhances our uh, 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 PBL uh, structure. And there is no overall solution for that also. We also always have to invent these, these things in concrete context. And sometimes in medicine that can be a, a different solution than, for instance, in European studies. And there the key is, that is I, what I forgot, uh, in, in my presentation, the key is there, we as a university, we also have to organize and reorganize maybe also this learning process, how we can learn from each other, how we learn from PBL. Uh, that we in our faculty do certain things, you know, that we invent maybe a tool for e-learning and that somehow we can communicate that with people in, in medicine or the other way around. And that is what we can organize on the managerial uh, level. And that is also, I think, a very important part of the, of the program and director. Yes. Um, this, uh, this is going to refer to the question that came from above about how, in what way the lectures or the presentations actually related to the medical department. I think that in essence, you can say that PBL is about three principles. One could say that uh, uh, one thing is that students learn in a constructive way and not receptive, not just receiving information, but constructing knowledge. The other thing is that it's built in a context, whether that's social or not, but referring to the fact that what they learn during university is linked directly to what they're going to do in the future so that it makes it easier for them to work or learn in the future. Uh, the other one is that we teach students on uh, learning how to learn, where to find information, and indeed, with the new technologies, try and find out which information is relevant or can be used or is valid to use. And obviously then Google is not a valid source, whereas at the same time there has been research on Wikipedia which shows that it was more correct on many cases compared to the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, so you can doubt about that and question that and have a debate about that. Um, having said that, these three principles, I think what usually triggers that 
And what I hear a lot from students in courses is that they like the link between theory and practice, case-based studies, which is what PBO in essence should be about. There is a case, whether that is Parkstadt Limburg, who can be seen as a patient, or whether it's a real patient with symptoms, it's a case that students start with and that triggers them to go into theory, come back to it and find an answer. That triggers construction of knowledge, etc., etc., and it links it to what they have to do in the future. So the question whether um, what was presented here is, for example, related to uh, PBL and using it in, in medical programs, it, I think brings us back to the very essential elements of what PBL is about. And then I think, in essence, there is no difference between the way the medical department approaches it with cases of patients or, in this case, uh, students in economics and business and politics that look at a different case. Not a patient, but just a company. And that's, that would be my response, but I'm wondering how people think about that. Because it was about differences that seem to be there, but that might not be there. I would like to make a remark in addition to what you say. What I hope is that what we have learned today and what we see, for example, in the university college and what is being done in one program or, or faculty, that these are very in, in inspiring uh, elements that can be used in other faculties. So I, my hope would be that we would listen better to each other, even between faculties, because there's a lot to learn and to, to make innovation, not for the innovation, but to make it better. Can I just... Hi. Well, in addition, I think, and that boils down to a lot we discussed, it is not about um, a copying think tank in every fact. It is not about uh, distributing iPads. It is about what are the underlying principles of um, learning that we want to, yeah. that, that, that which we, what are our goals? If we use technology, what are the, how does, for, it starts with our principles and, and the goals we have and then see how technology can connect to that, not the other way around. Or, be, or it being completely void of any thinking of underlying principles. And I, again, quality, for example, uh, those kind of issues are very important. Yes. I saw a, a minute ago uh, uh, someone waving in back there. Is that still valid? <laughs> Yo, in between, yeah. <laughs> I have a question to have. Please. I very much like this presentation just to introduce myself. I'm this bird on the top. <laughs> Are you so all the shit? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's have a long discussion of that. <laughs> Sufficient locations. Um, I think uh, Hank talked really about the broader area uh, of education and worldwide, and I would very much agree with him. And I think the discussion which we're having now is a bit uh, in a kind of a different setting because I do believe that this university, Hank, but maybe you can comment on that is not part of this whole education world and it is changing. It has changed very rapidly, very fast. Actually, that has attracted me tremendously almost to this university. But on the general question, the general question I have also for this university, a challenge, but broader for the education research community, which is also well represented here. Because I was also in different stages in life, in different positions, uh, dealing also with change. And actually, most of the time, lacking the background. Why were we involved in this change? Uh, how strong were the analytical underpinnings of the direction in which we were going? And so my question to Hang is, he had this list of, say, reasons why change wasn't taking place while you would expect it from circumstantial evidence. So is also the lack of good research, or maybe better, the organization of the research, because in my view, it's not a matter of money. It's really the way in which we have organized ourselves in the research community. Does that also have an impact? And of course, that is with our own discussion in the sense that we should maybe tie our research more along major social questions and build up momentum. Uh, very much a, a discussion which is taking place here uh, with a lot of tension, because that is not our heritage. Henry, I'll come to you. Um, well, just responding, let me clarify one, one point here. I, I wouldn't argue that change hasn't taken place, but it's taken place very idiosyncratically. 
and let, let me be perhaps unfair, but um, I learned about PBL actually from the Netherlands, from the medical schools of the Netherlands, through a colleague of mine, Dick Snow, a psychologist, may he rest in peace, not because he was a psychologist, but because he succumbed to uh, disease. Uh, in the 70s, he spent a year here in Holland, studying what the medical schools were doing. And he, to a large degree at least, brought PBL back to the States, again, through medical education, not uh, through these other areas. Now that's interesting to me because we're talking about someone who did this 40 years ago. And if this is a revolution, and if there has been support and influential people pushing this forward, why is it that it is so idiosyncratic? I mean, for me, the conversation right here in the university, someone asking questions about, well, of what use can this be in medical education, raises very interesting questions internally when, when, when I hear something like that. The important point is we have not created change, broadly speaking, so that there can be brilliant and wonderful things happening in a classroom, in a department, in a university, but has it really swept? I mean, we've also shown empirically, as I understand it, in the medical literature, that in many important areas of medicine, students actually do better with PPL than the traditional education, the memorization of all of the biological and anatomical and all that stuff. And then, now that they have the accumulation, they can go out and diagnose cases. I would rather hear them talk about Bayes' law, because at least this represents a process of knowledge of, as you add to that knowledge and experience, how you change your views and, th and things of this sort. So to me, I think that at the micro level, we do see change. But there's something that's happening that prevents that change from becoming, using a medical analogy, epidemiological. It doesn't really spread. The interesting thing is to look at the history of educational technology because, again, I'm very sympathetic with those who, who, who show the things from YouTube, who show all the excitement, but the fact of the matter is that the use of technology requires a lot of other things. In the US, we have a hip hop generation, and they have the iPods, and they have the iPads, and they have all kinds of things. What they don't have is a sense of time management. They don't have self-discipline. I just jotted these down. They don't know how to learn from failure. They don't have patience. They don't have an internal world in which they reflect on what they see. They don't have any sense of metacognition, that is basically how they learn. They don't have any sense of um, listening. They don't listen. In fact, they need many stimuli at the same time. Um, they don't have persistence. And I heard the word responsibility in the think tank. That's, that's extremely important. So it seems to me that there's a scaffolding on which these new changes have to take place. In the States, if you go to an employer, you know, we're, we're very self-critical of our educational system, as, as you may know or you may not know. But if you pick up something in the newspaper, you will never see anything that says we've ever done anything great educationally, except in, in some sense, this, the superficial readings of the universities. And people don't even celebrate that. It's how terrible our, our students are in terms of knowledge, how poor a job we do. They beat up on teachers and, and so on and so forth. Uh, th that's, that's the way that we look at our system. But what's interesting is when you go to employers, and you ask employers, what is it you want in workers? What are you missing? They never start off talking about cognitive skills. They always start off in talking about, I want workers who are responsible, who want to learn, et cetera, et cetera. Some of that list that I've given you, that's not our hip hop <laughs> generation, but our hip hop generation knows Google, is constantly scanning the web, looking for things quickly, you know, uh, knowledge is quotations, so you get some quotations. 
And it seems to me that we have to be very careful here and, and understand that you need a kind of scaffold. You need, a, you need something different than the technology and than many of the things, in, in my view, that, that we've been talking about. Thank you. Last question. And if you have a small one, a very, very small, probably small one, but probably not. Uh, it's about the concept of change. Uh, I'm from the psychology department, and basically we know that we learn lifelong. And this discussion is about higher education, and us, us defines as us coming from universities. Uh, and you, of course, is going up to clustering higher education policies in Europe, for example, which is good, I think. But uh, if you think the child is developing from from uh, the mother's womb, um, right from the scratch. How do we di discuss all our problems here in terms of defining change, understanding the change in students, uh, with others that actually are confronted with the uh, with the same uh, problem earlier in life uh, of students, like uh, um, high schools, um, um, basic schools, and so on. And I haven't heard anything about this uh, from from you. Uh, or from me, so I would like to have some thoughts about uh, whether this, com this, this issue is larger than just addressing higher education. Please be short. Who? Yes. It's very short. Very, very short. short. In innovation is not a knowledge problem, it's a social problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, it's very short. Now, now, now um, I, I've, I remember that for 20 years I was searching for the holy grail of innovation. You know, why is it that school, some schools change and others don't? Because in my work I learned that even when I was teaching them in workshops what problem-based learning was all about, and one year later we'd go back to the school, they didn't do it. Because they didn't get it. Now research consistently shows that innovation only works if your organization is not over the edge in terms of being efficiency driven. Because as, as soon as you are only targeting on being efficient, you will lose any momentum to connect people and to start talking about each other's work. So that connects also to Jo's question. I think the issue is not whether educational research is lagging behind. They may or they may not. The issue is much more the implementation. So what we are lacking more or less is a social technology where you can learn how to implement findings from research and, and you know, uh, impose it on yourself. That's my answer. Thank you very much. We have come to an end. Excuse me, the time is over. Um, I would like to give the word to uh, Professor Mols. Maybe you have some wise conclusions for us after this morning of information and discussion. I married twice. <laughs> What's so laughable about that? <laughs> it's a ticket to become a rector. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I will not draw any conclusion of this seminar this morning, and I will not give any answer to many questions that have been raised. Even if I could do so, I wouldn't do so, because I think that we have to leave with even more questions than we came in this morning. That's part of the learning process, I would say. In 1981, when I came to this university, I came to the university because it was a rebellious university. It was mentioned this morning. At least rebellious, I would say. But it always also promised to be a very innovative university in terms of at least education and it was student-centered which became manifesto in the system of problem-based learning and as a lawyer I was a practicing lawyer then in the city of The Hague and I really did believe I was convinced that you should deliver problems to the students in, er in order to start the learning process. 
And then the question was, of course, what kind of problems would you like to present to your students? Is work a problem? Or is not being able to get a job a problem? Is housing a problem? Or is not having a house a problem? And then we have had very interesting discussions in the early years of the Faculty of Law. And what I see today is that we have had very interesting developments in and around the problem-based learning system in the past 35 years. We have seen some examples this morning. The think tank, for instance, at the University College Maastricht. The college itself is very renewal. Students organizing conferences. Last week I had the honor to open a conference on communication during crisis, also organized by students themselves. Journals published by students at these universities, and even students organize their own classroom. So what we see is that there are some very good examples of renewal developments in and around the problem-based learning system. So, are we too late? Wim presented us a very provocative slide. It's eight minutes, minutes past twelve. I'm not quite sure whether we are too late. I would say I'm sure we're not too late because we have already started to develop the problem-based learning system. We are not restarting PBL. We are renewing the problem-based learning system because of the fact that we are entering, how we would like to continue to enter a new era, an era with new technologies, an era with new kind of students. I was very impressed, I must say, by the movie Wim showed us, for different reasons. First of all, what we saw is that students were expecting different things from the teachers. And students were connected to the world. And that's a matter of technology, of course. But it was also a matter of content. The remark on the costs of the computer, of the portable computer, the laptop of the student, related to the salary of poor people in the world. That's about content. And if we talk about the restart of problem-based learning, we are talking about methodology, but we are also talking about content. What would students like to learn? And what would we like them to learn? That has to do with our globalizing environment. And it has to do with the function of this university. At service to society, of course. And that has to have consequences for the content of our problems. So we are challenged as a rebellious university by our environment, by the changes, by the challenges, and we will respond. And we did so by organizing our university-wide program leading in uh, learning. And what we need is indeed being rebellious, continue to be rebellious, and take students very seriously. Rijn de Wilde mentioned dedication. We need dedication of the teachers, of course. But we also need involvement. And we need commitment. Commitment by the staff, academic staff and support staff. But also involvement, dedication and commitment by our students. Let us continue replacing fear of the unknown with curiosity in the years to come. I would like to thank the speakers of this morning, the keynote speakers, the people who reacted on that, the students 
and also the chair of this seminar. And I would like to thank you for being with us today and for participating in the discussion. And by saying so, I close this seminar. Thank you.